So I stand between you and lunch, and I stand between you and lunch with law, which is not really a very good idea because it's not usually the subject that most interests people. What I'm going to try to do is uh, give a little bit of the background for the legal, of the legal issues in which the, all the presentations that we've heard so far operate. Uh, they, the, all the presentations that we've heard so far uh, are to some extent operating despite the fact that the law isn't quite where it should be yet. And I think that's what, the, what has to happen. We have to carry on, we have to move on, and we have to seize the opportunities of e-health, of telemedicine, without letting, it, uh, letting the law stand in our way. Um, I'm not going to read through all this, but let me just remind you that telemedicine is the, was the title of this talk, but of course telemedicine can mean all sorts of things, from simply talking to a patient on a telephone and via email or via video, uh, right down to continuous glucose monitoring for a patient with diabetes, remote surgery, and the use of apps. Do we have EU-level responses for telemedicine? Well, yes, we have some. And my click, ah, okay, this is a rather slow response. Yes, we have some, but not quite as many as we ought to have. The first thing to note is that telemedicine, or whatever other variation of label we want to put on it, is governed by two areas of law under the Treaty of the European Union. And Articles 56 and 57, they are mon it is monitored by health law and information society law. And this is probably where the first problem lies. There is no such thing as telemedicine law per se. It's a patchwork of law out of other areas. This is a... Okay. Um, however, there are some important pieces of legislation which really do drive healthcare, uh, telemedicine healthcare forward. And the most important of those is Directive 2011-24-EC, which you will probably know as the Cross-Border Healthcare Directive. And actually, today is an important day because tomorrow is the last day by which uh, this directive has to be transposed into European law. So today is the last day a member state would have the possibility to say that it does not have adequate law for cross-border care using telemedicine or e-health. The build on this is so slow. Um, we also have uh, within that legislation specific delegated legislation. That's when the European Commission is entitled to make specific legislation around rare disease networks and e-prescription. So we do have some law, but am I, is, am I doing something That's wrong? Right, yeah. Okay, we'll do that one. Okay, but EU law in healthcare is limited and it's particularly limited by the concept of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity means that law has to be made at the lowest possible level, that means at a national or regional level. We also have some significant legal and ethical concerns that remain and there are many different areas of law that applies. I already mentioned at the beginning, but just to give you an example up to date, last week the European Court of Justice made a decision in the Doc Morris case on whether or not internet pharmacies can exist. And that, that decision of the Court of Justice was made on the basis of trade law, not on the basis of healthcare law. So it's important to realize that when we talk about telemedicine law, we're talking about trade law, e-commerce law, network security law, cross-border rights, information society, uh, all sorts of things, not e-health as such. So what are the big challenges that still remain? The one that always comes up most is data protection and privacy. Do we have adequate law to protect the data that moves around the system? Data is the fuel of e-health, of telemedicine. Without data moving around, we can't have e-health. But there is always a thought in many people's minds that we don't have adequate data protection. 
Do we have enough law around liability and redress? When we're doing telemedicine or e-health and the sort of things that we've heard about in these presentations, where we bring many people together virtually around different environments, do we have the laws and the rules in place to compensate patients if something goes wrong? And do we know how to spread that liability? Have we tackled the issues of access and equity properly, or are we in danger through, this is more of an ethical than a legal challenge, through telemedicine of creating an even greater gap? A lot of the stories that we've heard about are for specialist environments like shipping, or therefore very well-established hospitals. And we talk, we talk more and more about apps that patients have, have in their pockets, but are these only patients who can afford to do it, or rich countries? And finally, what are we doing to the doctor-patient relationship? Are we undermining the key human element of good health care? Let me pick, unpick some of these. On data protection, I believe that we are a long way towards solving the problem. And we're a long way towards solving it through the General Data Protection Directive 2016, which will come into force in 2018. It covers many issues, and I've just given you some bullet points here of the key issues that it covers as far as sharing of health data are concerned. The important one, and the one that we always talk about first, is consent. We must remember that when we share health data, generally we do so with the consent of the patient, but we mustn't tie ourselves in knots. This doesn't mean that we have to have written, informed consent to every action. It means that patients must understand what their data is being used for and must feel confident that they have consented to its use. It doesn't require written consent. Many people demand written consent, but it is not a legal requirement. The law does, however, create, together with Directive 2011-24, the right to record access and portability. This is extremely important because it's what allows us to take healthcare into a different dimension. It means that it puts patients in control of their records and they can take their record to another healthcare provider in order to get a second opinion. You will notice I have not talked about ownership of a record, and I do that intentionally. I don't think it is helpful to talk about ownership of healthcare records. It is a legally very uncertain area, and I don't think it moves us further any, any further forward. I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do want to point out to you the last two bullet points. If you are going to... In, go into any e-health or telemedicine ventures like the ones that we've heard, this new law puts two new duties on you. First, you must conduct a data protection impact assessment. That means you have to have somebody who's technically competent to assess whether what you're doing creates a data protection risk, and you must have a data protection officer. Now, many hospitals already have them, many tech companies already have them, but not all, and we know that this is an area of startups, and it's expensive to do these activities. So we must make sure that we find a way of making sure that data protection impact assessment happens without stifling innovation. Uh, the other issue is to say that uh, privacy in telemedicine has not been defined and regulated. Um, so, like all the other things that I've said, it is based on privacy regulation generally and not specific. The other three issues I'm going to lump together because I don't have time to go through all the areas of law that exist. But I want to draw your attention again to the cross-border care directive, which has within it so much uh, in order to help countries, member states, uh, work together to address the issues of liability, of the doctor-patient relationship, and of access and equity. And it is particularly important to notice that this uh, 
directive brings with it several mentions of the importance of standardization. Whether that is a normative standardization in economic terms about how reimbursement for cross-border care is worked out, or whether it's a technical standardization of what an electronic health record should look like or how the, the security should be protected. It is in embracing the concept of standardization and regulation that we have within that directive that is really taking us forward. And a lot of that is also embedded then in further delegated legislation. So we now have further delegated legislation on how to handle consent in the European uh, reference networks for rare diseases. And I particularly want to mention the rare diseases networks because it goes particularly towards addressing the issue of access and equity. The rare diseases networks are a way of using telemedicine and e-health to make sure that in countries where you have a very small number of patients with a particular condition, you can share the expertise around the European Union so that the person, the patient, wherever they are, is not doesn't suffer any detriment because they are one of one, two, five cases in that country. When you have a rare disease and the physician in your country has never seen it before, we have to ensure that that physician can talk to other people in other parts of the world, the European Union in particular, to share their expertise. Again, however, we must always remember that there are still many derogations, there are still many issues that are unclear, and the one that I would draw your attention to in particular is the Directive on the Recognition, recognition of Qualifications has still not been addressed to uh, fit e-health and telemedicine. So this directive provides the law that if you are qualified as a doctor in one European country or as a nurse, you can go practice in another European country. But it is old fashioned. It is based on physically moving to establish yourself to practice in another country. It hasn't yet been adapted to moving your service electronically. And we need to address that issue still. So, have we solved all the problems? No, we certainly haven't. The four big problems still remain. But I think we need to see every single one of these challenges as also an opportunity. Data protection and privacy is a problem in e-health and telemedicine, but it's a problem in healthcare. We routinely lose patient records when they're written on paper. We routinely... Uh, well, lose them either physically um, because of fire or water damage or because they're simply lost in time. Um, moving to e-health and telemedicine gives us the opportunity to have much better privacy, to have controlled access. When you have a paper record, it's very difficult to prove who last looked at it. But when you have a written re uh, an electronic record, you can have proper audit trail. You can have detailed forms of consent. You can have specific consent for looking at different parts of the record separately. And we've heard about Norway, the issue about looking at the, the psychiatric record differently from a general health record. So whilst there is a problem around data protection and privacy, I would argue that telemedicine gives us the opportunity to get it right. Get it right not only when we practice through telemedicine care at a distance, but when we practice healthcare. Liability and redress is also easier to solve through telemedicine because we have standardization, we have evidence, we have outcomes measurement in a way that we don't have in more traditional forms of medicine. In terms of access, I've already mentioned rare diseases. Telemedicine could create problems of access and equity. On the other hand, it could really overcome them as well. And finally, the doctor-patient relationship. Yes, it could be undermined by remote care, but I think actually it will create much better doctor-patient relationships because we will have more informed and more engaged patients and better prepared visits. So whilst these four problems are a problem, they're not peculiar to telemedicine, and actually I think every single one of them is an opportunity. And I'm going to leave you with four
cartoons, just so that you feel a bit happier before lunchtime. If we don't have proper rules and government governance around privacy, we're going to have a problem and we might end up in court. And we've got to take it seriously. If we don't address the trust and accreditation issues, and particularly the point I raised about the, cross, about the mutual recognition of qualifications, we will undermine the trust that people need because, who knows, it could be a dog at the other end of that telemedicine consultation. I hope not, but possibly. And if we don't have properly established standards for interoperability, we could end up with this kind of situation where the key element of a message is lost in translation and we will cause harm to the patient. But most importantly, if we don't address it, the issues, if we don't adapt our laws to create new rules for addressing new ways of doing healthcare, will miss a really important opportunity. So I'd like to leave you with the message that, yes, we don't have all the legal answers yet, but we must find those answers, and actually most of the challenges are also opportunities. Thank you.